Hi there, and welcome to the Everyday Millionaire Podcast. My name is Patrick Francie, and I'm the CEO of the Real Estate Investment Network. In addition to being a business owner, I'm also a real estate investor, I'm a coach, I'm a husband, I'm a very proud grandfather. And along with that, I'm also committed to stretching beyond what I've already achieved and of living a fulfilled life by continuing to make a positive difference in the world. I invite you to join me to listen in on the Everyday Millionaire podcast as I interview and have conversations with seemingly ordinary individuals who have achieved some pretty extraordinary results, whether it be in their life, in their business, in real estate. And it's here where I'm going to delve into the details of their journey, along with the paths they've traveled to get where they are today and, as importantly, where they intend to go in the future. My guests are here to inspire. They're here to help you learn by talking about what's real for them, both in their wins and in their challenges, from the life and the lifestyle they live to the person they had to become along the way in creating and building their financial futures for themselves and their families. Before I begin this episode, I'll start by first thanking you for listening in and for your support and the feedback you provide us on the show, as well as to ask you to please continue to send your comments, your suggestions, or your questions directly to me at CEO at RainCanada.com. That is CEO at R-E-I-N Canada.com. And if you're inclined, please share this podcast with your friends, your family, and with people you know, or perhaps even people you don't know. Rate the show and comment on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, or whatever platform you happen to use to listen in. And while you're at it, please follow me on the Everyday Millionaire Facebook page. So thanks again for the feedback you provide us. It's definitely appreciated. Okay, let's get on with this show and have a conversation with today's guest. Jeff Gunther is an extraordinary individual who's been a top performer in both business and in real estate. He's an accomplished speaker, a business advisor, as well as a philanthropist. Now, the journey of seemingly ordinary individuals achieving extraordinary results comes with its highs and its lows and, of course, the many challenges. Jeff's absolutely no exception to that. And today he joins me to share his journey in achieving his goals and the path he had to choose when he came to the defining fork in the road as he found himself facing a life-changing crisis. Listen in. Let's get started. Jeff Gunther, welcome to the Everyday Millionaire Podcast. So nice to have you on the show. It's been many, many years since we've crossed paths, but uh, thanks for joining me today, Jeff. Well, thanks, Patrick. Great to be here. So, Jeff, let's kick it off. You know, uh, of course, the audience doesn't know you, and I'm just getting to know you again. uh, I've been kind of following along. I've been, I guess maybe that would be called creeping you on social media, but, you know, then you're putting it out there, so it's not really... So, Jeff, you know, uh, when people are asking you these days, what do you do? What is your answer to that question? I call myself a real estate leader. Uh, Mostly today, I'm managing a large portfolio. I I haven't acquired anything in a little over a year. And uh, we are we're managing our portfolio here in Alberta. I am doing some uh, coaching, uh, educating, and I'm writing a book called... uh, your unfair advantage. Wow. So that gives us a lot of places to dig into. So that's awesome. Now, just tell me a little bit about portfolio. You're single family, multifamily, commercial. I know that you grew to be pretty diverse. You've been doing the real estate game for uh, many years. Why don't you give me a little bit of that background? Well, uh, Patrick, do you want me to start the beginning? Sure. Why don't we do that? (laughs) Um, I, I like to say when I and my mother corrects me because I get this story wrong and I'm sure she's right. But when I was uh, when I was very young, probably grade five or six, I learned that my parents actually owned a home in another town that they were unable to sell when they got transferred. And somebody else was living in our old house and paying a, a mortgage. My dad explained all this to me because he was doing his income taxes and he explained that to me too. And I, that that was that kind of got me the real estate bug. And then it wasn't until uh, a number of years later, I, uh, as I finished high school, I picked up uh, some books. I, I, I seem to remember Mark O. Haraldson was the first book I read on real estate. Mm-hmm. And uh, then... Uh, in um, 
in Lake Louise, I bought a, my first investment was a trailer home, which is not a real estate investment because they can move. Yeah. And in fact, it was stolen. <laughs> but, but for, <laughs> well, that would be for an a number interesting of, story. <laughs> for a number of years, uh, that home was occupied by the ski school director of uh, Lake Louise in the winter and the mountain manager in the summer. And the rent was paid for by Skiing Louise. And I had positive cash flow of, I think, $276 a month 35 years ago. And I was able to travel around California in a little BMW with uh, a ski rack on the roof and find all the ski, all the really amazing ski areas in California. And every month I had this check to put in the bank. And uh, I thought if I had 10 of those and Patrick, honestly, I never got to 10 of those until about 10 years ago. I got a real estate license. I learned how to, I, I learned how to invest in real estate. I dabbled it in it. I got up to about six units and I, I did not get to the point where I am now till I hit a crisis point about 10 years ago. Okay. Well, that's interesting. So I want to talk about the crisis point, but I want to go back just a little bit to dig in at a starting point, which you said when your dad sat down with you, how old were you when your dad first sat down with you and, and talked a little bit about real estate? I don't think he intended to talk to me about real estate. He was telling me about income taxes because yeah. that's it looked it looked like he was doing homework at the dining room table. Sure. And I would have been how old are we in grade five? Ten? Ten. Yeah, I was gonna say ten, eleven. Yeah. Yeah. And but but it tweaked your interest there, which is interesting, right? It's it's kind of like, you know, some kids would have gone, Okay, dad, you know, you know, let me know when you're done so you can come out and, you know, chuck a ball with me or something. And, and you, it registered for you a little bit differently, which for me is always, how do people's brains fire when they're yeah. kids? You know, it's, it's just an interesting component because, you know, for me, I know, you know, if my dad did that, I would have literally said, okay, well, you know, I'm going to go out and play. Let me know when you can join me. Right. So it's just a difference of wiring. That's all. It was just an observation. So let's go, let's jump ahead now to the crisis. You know, what, what was the crisis that occurred that got you saying, okay, because 275 bucks, 265 bucks, 35 years ago, that was a lot of dough. And if you're going into the U.S., I think U.S. and Canadian dollar would have been on par. Canadian dollar may have been stronger than the U.S. dollar back then, uh, mm -hmm. slightly, marginally. But so you come ahead this many years later, what is the crisis that strikes you to say, okay, well, I got to get off my ass and get some real estate done? Patrick, I'm going to be a really bad interview and jump back to your earlier thought. Please. About, and then, um, hey, listen, that's, uh, this is how this show goes, right? Because when, when you said, uh, you know, what was it when you were nine or 10 that tweaked you? Nobody's ever asked that before. And, and you had me thinking about it. I had a brother who was a year older than me, Dan. And uh, Dan and I, we had, we kind of had our bedrooms in the basement. So we would talk late at night and work on things. And uh, we did a lot of entrepreneurial things together. I think it was kind of led by him. And uh, we, we created a newspaper for the neighborhood. We, we did bottle drives with the other kids so that we could go to the fair in the summer and things like that. So I, I think my, I, I credit my brother who passed away about a year ago mm. for um, uh, his mentorship in that. Sorry, a little emotional. Sure. Um, but I also have a father who uh, always answered questions. And, and that, was, that was instrumental in my life, that, that curiosity uh, came out. So uh, he, he could have brushed me away, but he, he took me and explained it to me. As, a, as an army kid, we moved a lot. And it was just kind of a surprise to me, I think, to learn that another family was living in our house. And, uh, and paying down, I mean, he explained what a mortgage was, you know, so I'm, I'm grateful for that upbringing. Now, it's interesting, you know, I've had this conversation many times, which is, you know, is entrepreneurship, is it, is it nature or is it nurture? You know, so, you know, the question I always go is, well, were your parents entrepreneurial? Where did that entrepreneurial spirit come from? Now, once again, you, you talk about an older brother who kind of was driving that way, but then you say, well, where the hell did that come from? You know, yeah. you know, is it, is it, you know, is it a, a genetic predisposition? Is it just hardwired? Is it like what happens that some entrepreneurs really come out of the shoot knowing that they're going to be, 
you know, entrepreneurs and others, it evolves over time. You know, my, for me, it was an entrepreneurial accident, although I was always driven to, you know, I had a picture of myself, you know, as a kid growing up, I, you know, it, as being, you know, some corporate office corner, you know, that was making really big dough. That was kind of the, the, that world. And I was in the corporate world for about eight years when I first came out of high school and then that was it. And then I never, you know, I never worked again for a, a company, but so I, I'm always curious from you when you think about it, when you reflect about it, was that entrepreneurial spirit kind of inherent in your dad and he never, but he stayed in the force or what do you think it was? What, what do you think got you going? Well, my father was a dentist at the time. Okay. Uh, he's, he's retired now. He's still with us. Okay. Well, um, dentist is entrepreneurial, right? Well, it's, it's technical. Um, yeah. And when you're in the armed forces, it's a job. Okay. Got it. And, he, okay. And then later he went into private practice and most dentists are forced to be business people. And, and many of them are, you know, they're great practitioners, but not great business people. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I learned that my father was pretty good at both. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think at a young age, I was curious about what am I going to do for a living? I, I think most kids at some point, you know, they look at what does their dad do? Maybe I'll be that. Yeah, yeah. And I looked at what my dad did. And, and honestly, I noticed that he had to show up every day. He had to show up to put his fingers in people's mouths and, and do dentistry. And I wanted, I, at an early age, I wanted to see if there was a way that I could earn a living without having to show up every day. And so when I learned that somebody else would pay for a house that you could then later sell, uh, it, it just, you know, I just wondered, what if you do more of those? So, you know, we, we talk about the crisis moment. Let's not go there. But between the time that you were, you know, skiing, you know, Colorado or, you know, or whatever that might have been and and realizing that you needed to buy more real estate, which you didn't do for quite some time. What were you doing in between all of that? What was your what was your kind of what gigs did you did you follow? Did you do you still did you were you an entrepreneur all of these years? Was there a job in there? How, what, yeah. was your, that, what was that path? Um, when I was uh, 15, I decided I wanted to start working. And I, one of the things that our family did was we'd go out for dinner. So I saw that there were guys just a little bit older than me that worked as waiters. And I thought, well, that's something that I can do. So I, I applied at a restaurant and the uh, person interviewing me uh, asked me how old I was. I said, 15. They said, you know, I'm sorry, you have to be 18 to be a waiter. And I said, thank you for that information. <laughs> and everything else, you're 18, <laughs> therefore. Going I, I applied <laughs> elsewhere. <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, as, a, as a waiter, I had, uh, it was entrepreneurial because you earn tips and I did quite well. In high school, uh, because we moved a lot, I went to a different high school, or sorry, a different school in grade five, or sorry, six, seven, eight, nine and 10 different school every year. I used that as an opportunity to reinvent myself. The first move was hard because you're leaving friends and you're young, but after a while you go, okay, I get it. Mm -hmm. uh, I can be more like Fonzie next year instead of <laughs> what, Potsy or Ralph. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> um, and, uh, and in grade 10 in, um, sorry, grade nine, I, we were in New Jersey and there was a guy named Joe who was the school president. I was very impressed with Joe, and I decided I'm going to be the school president in grade 12, whatever school I'm in. Mm. And uh, in Ontario, we had grade 13. We moved back to Ottawa, and I was indeed the uh, school president. But uh, I also was attracted to theater, and we had a drama club, and uh, I was very involved in that. I was the president of that, and... Uh, we put on big productions and uh, and charities for the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario because we sold out our auditorium, which was exceptional. And uh, and so running the school, running a tram club, uh, I thought that I wanted to be an actor. And uh, I had uh, registered for Ryerson uh, in uh, Toronto. My mother said, oh, Jeffrey, don't be ridiculous. And I think she was right because acting is kind of hard. <laughs> to make to make a 
make a living at. And so I was left without, you know, I wasn't, I, I wasn't going to school that year. So I, I moved out West to, um, to Banff and uh, started to Jasper first and worked at Jasper Park Lodge in hospitality. And then the next winter, I decided I wanted to ski at Sunshine Village. So I didn't wait for an ad. I drove up to Sunshine Village and, and at the, uh, if you've ever been there, there's a, there's a gondola that you go to the top and in the summer, there's a, a road that comes down. So I drove up and I called up to the, uh, the I guess, uh, HR department and uh, I announced myself. I'm Jeff Gunther. And they said, oh, are you here for the position to interview for the position of maitre d'? And I said, yes, I am. <laughs> I didn't know they were doing that. I was just looking to, to work as a waiter. Well, they sent a truck down, drove me up. I met with the innkeeper. He was so apologetic because he'd misplaced my resume. I said, don't worry about it. He never had it. <laughs> and, and he was double apologetic because he had just offered the position to the person before me. And I said, oh, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry you did that. And he said, can I introduce you to my boss, who's the vice president of resorts? I said, sure. So I met the vice president of resorts, had a conversation, and I was offered two positions, either the staff bar, supervisor of the staff bar, I would have been the most popular person on the Hill, or uh, the day lodge cafeteria supervisor. I knew restaurants by then because I'd actually worked in restaurants for th three or four years by then, but I had never done a cafeteria. So I said, I'm going to pick the one that I don't know. Well, by Christmas, I had opened a wine and draft saloon. I had um, added, a, a, I, I noticed that the hotel didn't have a gift shop. So I designed a gift shop. I added a, there was an old um, cloak room that I converted into a snack bar and kept adding revenue sources and by well by christmas or just after i was effectively managing almost all of the food and beverage operations at one of canada's largest ski areas i remember being with marty the vice president at a conference on my birthday and uh, i said oh by the way it's my birthday today he said how old are you and i said i'm turning 20 and he just went <laughs> don't tell me that <laughs> I, I i just i, so I dug in and i figured things out now what's and, what you know how are like how aware you know what i'm hearing in all of that right is your ability to number one pitch a deal you know you're 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 selling yourself and and you you may not have been thinking it in those terms but you pivoted quickly you're thinking quickly on your feet you, you i'm assessing what you're what you were actually doing your vp under sees you as 20 years old here's your 20 years old that's like a shock to him. But in all of that story, what I'm hearing in it is that your ability to number one, think quickly on your feet. Number two, you're pitching the deal. Like you're, you're selling yourself in all of that. So that takes a lot of confidence to do that. And, and I'm wondering, are you aware of yourself at that time? Like, or, or is this just how you're built? This is the thing. The reason I, I get into the a, a little bit of the psychology of it is Jeff is because, of course, we work for with thousands of business yeah. owners and real estate investors across the country, and we hear all sorts of reasons of why people, you know, are struggling. What what is it about? What's the difference between how you're wired and how some people see themselves as wired? So I'm I'm, I'm a little bit curious always as to when you see individuals like yourself who really accomplished a lot of things over the years, but you're talking about at 20 years old, having the awareness and the wherewithal to pitch yourself, to kind of stretch and, and live into yeah. some, you know, to, to, to stretch into something you're not yet, but convincing that person that you're there, let's say a little bit of sales ability, but it's the confidence to say, no, I got this. I'll, I'll take it on. I'm willing to take it on and actually making a choice that's going to stretch you called, well, I'll take on, you know, cafeteria management. So, that's all to ask the question is, what was your level of awareness back then? And when you reflect on it, were you, do you think you were aware or you're just in survival mode? You're just doing what you need yeah. to do. Yeah, I, I think, uh, I, I think anybody can do what I did. I, and again, as you asked the question, I realized that it's having a good mentor or coach or people in your corner that care about you. I had my older brother. I had my dad, both my parents, my mom and my dad. Mm -hmm. But throughout high school, the um, uh, Eleanor Crowder was the, uh, the drama t 
teacher and, uh, and, and she took an interest in me. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so I learned from her. And when I was uh, the school principal, Wayne Belanger took an interest in me. So I was organizing things in high school. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, then I went out and got my first job and your supervisor and your first job will take an interest in you. If you're, if you're trying to learn, you ask questions, uh, you find people in your life that take an interest in you and it moves you to another level. Mm -hmm. So I had, uh, I had, you know, great early work experiences and, and I think that gave me the confidence to go, you know what, I've got this, I, I can figure this out. And also, uh, one of the, one of the blessings of working for a large organization is you get to test your entrepreneurial uh, aptitude or skills with somebody else's money. And you've got wiser people ahead of you that are not going to let you do something that that's going to be a mistake. And where you're missing resources, they're going to connect you to the people who have that. So I had an infrastructure around me that I was able to do those things. And I had, uh, I was ambitious, I guess. Sure. And I had, I had little to lose. And, and good support around me. So uh, wherever we're starting from, whether, whether you're nine or 10 years old or you know, 60 or 70 years old, there are people that are ahead of us that care about us and will take an interest in us mm -hmm. and give us that little bit of extra confidence that we need to, to take the next step. Yeah, and I, and I think that you know, it's interesting when we talk about when you you mentioned that you had mentors and people that got behind you and guided you, but you're not know, a, a principal and a teacher and and supervisors, you know, as a as a entrepreneur for the past 35 plus years and a coach and doing the things that I do, there are certainly individuals and, and I love working with young people. And but having said that, you also spot the potential in some young people where others don't display it. You see coachability, you see willingness. Uh, not everybody is wired for that. You know, so you're, yeah. you know, your, your principal and your teacher, as an example, probably didn't see you as a, uh, you know, as a, as a charity case, oh, we got to help this poor Jeff out. They saw you as an overachiever, as somebody who wants to, to take it on and grow and build and, yeah. and, and be coachable. So it's, uh, you know, I'm going to go back to my dad again. When I was young, I thought I wanted to, when I was 12, I thought maybe I wanted to be a surgeon. And my dad had a friend who was a surgeon. He got me in to uh, watch him for a day and uh, they suited me up. And while we were driving to the hospital, he said, ask lots of questions. If you just stand there and watch, he'll think you're not interested ask lots of questions. And so I did. And, and that little bit of advice is helpful. So if, you, if, if we're not curious, if we're not reaching out or asking questions, then the mentor or the coach will not show up. Right. That, and that is a critical component, isn't it? Is as individuals being curious. And if we can teach our kids anything, is be curious and understand what even being coachable is. So that's a, a, a conversation for another time. But you know, so you've gone on this journey, you've got this foundation that you seem to have started to build on as a young man. And, and the real estate thing kicked in, you did some stuff. And then you had the realization that you need more cash flowing doors. Let's go back to that part of the story. And so you're building your career, you're doing other business stuff. But let's just jump ahead quickly to the story about the real estate when was the realization after you had the realization what prevented you from buying those that more doors that you were thinking about buying well i think i was focused on building a career in the ski industry at the time mm -hmm. so real estate was a side mm -hmm. it wasn't a necessity and uh and i i moved up through i eventually became a ski area manager by the time i was 21 and it was at a, a small area in Edmonton and Edmonton doesn't have a summer resort season. So I, I took a course and I think Patrick, uh, it was by Raymond Aaron called how to really make it in real estate back about 35 years ago mm -hmm. it was a yellow plastic binder. I think it had about 17 pages in it and everything he taught worked. And what I did that summer is I went and got a real estate job. 
I, I, I got a real estate license and I sold real estate because I wanted to get the transactions through just like working in somebody else's business. You can be entrepreneurial without risking your own money in if you want to learn about real estate and you have a real estate job, you can get mileage on, on yourself. So I picked up a few properties then, but mostly I was transacting real estate investment transactions for investors that were older and wiser. And I got to see them uh, and what they did and, and facilitate those trades. I wish I had done all of them myself because the returns they got were extraordinary uh, in a in a few years, when a property goes from 50,000 to 70,000 in the space of about three, four years, and your down payment has been a thousand or fifteen hundred dollars, that's about two thousand percent return was about the average on on those exits. So I wish I wished I'd done that, but again, I didn't. So mm-hmm. why didn't I, Patrick? That's that's the there's the hundred thousand dollar question. Or... Multi-million dollar question, whatever that might be. They all would have been paid off by now (laughs) if I had just bought them and held them on my own. Mm -hmm. I was attracted to teaching. That's Mm. the answer. Mm. So I, again, I was not a good salesperson when I first started. The first six months was horrible, but I didn't want to fail. And so I found a good real estate uh, sales trainer who whose name was floyd wickman and i just i listened i plugged those cassettes in my car and i listened to them all the time and i just did what he said and then i started sounding like him when i when i was uh, on listing appointments and I, I i did very well going forward from there and in order to give back to him i wanted to i wanted to be a speaker trainer i figured it was a way to take my burgeoning business experience and my love of theater or acting or being on stage and actually speak and teach something. And so I was hired or I was recruited by one of Canada's largest ski or sorry, one of Canada's largest real estate organizations to be their national trainer. I did that for a couple of years. Didn't buy any more real estate while I was doing that. It was then, after a couple of years, that my father reached out to me because in his dental practice, he had a problem that needed to be solved. And he asked if I could come for three weeks and help him out. Well, my dad and I were in business with two other partners for 11 years because I used my hospitality background, my sales background, applied them now to dentistry and was able to quadruple their bottom line within the first year. And then we went on to develop large customer-oriented multidisciplinary group dental practices in the city of Ottawa, of which I was a full partner in. That distracted me from real estate. I mean, you're building a great career. You're building businesses. You're probably making good dough. You're making good money. At some point, you're probably having the realization of, but what is, what is, what am I building for my future? Was that a conversation you were having with yourself? Yeah. And I'm waiting for you to ask me the crisis story again, because we're getting really close. I know we're getting close. (laughs) I know we're getting close, but I want to, I want to hear a little bit about, because here's the, here's the thing, you know, I've heard different versions of this story, you know, many, many times, right? It's like the distraction that we have in life, you know, uh, I started, I didn't start uh, investing in real estate till I was over 40, you know, just over 40. And I had lots of distractions. And then even along the way, I think about the deals that I didn't do because I was busy or whatever the story might be. Now, I don't complain about my real estate portfolio. I had to clean it up and, you know, I had a partner that I had bought me out, you know, and got a great deal, but it served me. So I don't care. But many have these stories about why didn't I start 10 years ago? Why didn't I start five years ago? And and so here we are, you're going through, you're building great business, you're busy doing what you're doing. You know, in the back of your mind, real estate works, Yeah. but you didn't do it. So now, yeah. then you came to a catalyst. A catalyst is a crisis of some sort, right? Yes. Uh, the pivotal moment, the, the fork in the road, so to speak. So... Tell us a little bit about that. So there is a faster way to earning uh, wealth than real estate, and that is in business. It's higher risk, Mm -hmm. but it's it's more secure if you do it right. So the, the business of dentistry was the right thing for me to be doing at that time. Sure. When I pulled the dental centers, in and around there, I 
I, I have no undergrad degree, but I did two master's degrees, one in business and the other in theology. The one in theology took me out to Vancouver. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was right around then that I had the question, Patrick, that you're asking is, uh, what, you know, why didn't you do this? What's this all building for? What's, what's this for? And, and I remember in June of 2017, realizing that I had some cash. I had a lot of cash from the sale of the dental business. And I had some business skills and I wasn't using them. And so I determined that I was going to make use of my talents and that in the, over the next 12 months, I was going to invest in projects and, and find things to do. So I made the mis in, in 2007, I invested in other people's real estate development projects, which did not go well, and bought a national chain of retail stores on April Fool's Day, 2008, mm. which I know you've got a retail background, Patrick. <laughs> I do. <laughs> 2008 was the worst year. We bought a company that was definitely a turnaround attempt and, uh, and we didn't make it. And so I found myself going from 10 years earlier being at a point in my life where I really didn't need to work anymore mm -hmm. to all of a sudden having a negative net worth because I did so many different things in one year and none of them worked out. So Jeff, you know, there's, of course, there's the story that, you know, the man who chases two rabbits catches none. Now, when you, when you reflect on that, do you think it was a lack of focus that caused it? Were you, did you have your fingers in too many pies? Do you think when you self, yes. when you self assess? Yeah. And I, and I think uh, success is six early success is a problem because we begin to think that we can do anything. Mm. I knew nothing about retail. Mm. Uh, I, I knew I could learn, but I didn't have the luxury of time to learn that. And, and so yeah, we, we have we have this assumption that if I could figure that out, I can figure this out. And that that year, by by the beginning of 2009, I was financially and emotionally exhausted. And uh, I found myself in Guelph, Ontario, where I didn't know anybody. Um, what am I doing here? Um, what do I do with the rest of my life? And I, I had a good friend, a couple that I know that... Uh, um, they said, come, come stay with us. Mm -hmm. And I stayed with them for, I don't know, maybe it was six weeks. I really don't know the time passed. I just didn't feel like doing anything. And then when I got my energy back, I realized, uh, you remember, um, Malcolm Gladwell's, I can't remember which book it was outliers, I think 10,000 hours. Yeah. So, uh, I think that book was out of around then. And, I, I looked at what do I have 10,000 hours in? It was the business of dentistry or real estate. And I'm not a dentist. So I said, it's going to have to be real estate. And I, I, was, I was free to go anywhere. And because I'm Canadian, I thought I'll, I'll stick to Canada. Could have gone anywhere in the world, I suppose. But uh, I figured... Canada is a good market. Could have been anywhere in Canada. I still owned property or well, a few properties in Alberta. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so I looked at, it had to be a major city. It was going to be Edmonton or Calgary. And uh, and I just had more connections in Edmonton. So mm -hmm. um, that and uh, and some with some help, uh, by the way, of the Real Estate Investment Network back then mm -hmm. in um, uh, research that was coming out about the, the uh, future of uh, Alberta and Edmonton, mm -hmm. uh, I made that choice. So you sit today. You're in Edmonton. Are you located in Edmonton? I'm. Yeah, I'm still in Edmonton. You're still in Edmonton, and and you're investing in real estate. Where you're primarily investing? All all of my holdings are in Edmonton, are in in Alberta right now, Edmonton or surrounding area. Yeah, and so as we as we sit here and and you know, you know, almost a year into a pandemic, uh, you haven't bought for the past year. Is that because of what was happening, uh, given uh, COVID and pandemic? Well, it's been it's in Alberta. It's it's painful in Alberta. Sure, uh, has has been since uh, the the oil price dropped in 2014. Didn't affect us at all until about the fall of 2015. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then we had uh, increasing vacancies and and flat rent, you know, 
rent increases. So there are when when things like that happen, there are buying opportunities, and so I took advantage of some of those. Yeah. How are you, just out of curiosity, how are you finding rents in Edmonton? You know, we still see them as flat, but we see them as actually coming up in some cases for the right properties. You know, they're getting cash flow. I mean, I know many members who are getting very strong cash flow on, uh, you know, especially on suited units, uh, you know, up, down, suited. But uh, what, what's your experience been? I have really two types of properties. I have townhouses, mm-hmm. which I selected because of the, their uh, volatility mm-hmm. when the when the market is bad, the price on townhouses goes way down. When the market is good, it goes up. And the reason is because in Edmonton, everybody wants the 1,200 square foot, three bedroom bungalow with a double garage off the alley. And when they can't afford that, a townhouse with um, all the same square footage, your own little yard becomes very attractive for half the price. And so uh, they're easier to manage because they're condominiums you only have to worry about the inside and keeping good relationships with the management companies and the condo boards Mm -hmm. so my townhouses are all full and uh, and they're renting well they're cash flowing well Uh, we also have large multifamily, and by large i mean 100 plus units and uh, those uh, they need the ones that have uh, something that's unique about them uh, so one of ours is a uh, condo um, conversion. It, it, well, it was built as condos and, and, um, and operated as apartments. It's, it's doing very well. Another, which is effectively a townhouse community or a hybrid between a townhouse and an apartment, is doing well because it is, uh, it, it's, it's unique in the marketplace. Uh, but anything that's just an apartment a two bed, a one bedroom or two bedroom apartment, uh, it can be it, the the quality that you're offering can be very good. But to get people to come in and take a look at that when they're shopping against a one or two bedroom apartment elsewhere, it's hard to keep the rents up in those. That's what we're finding. I, I, I don't know if you're seeing something. Well, we're, I mean, what's happening, of course, is that in the world of Edmonton specifically, you know, and in Calgary as well. I mean, there's a condo glut. I mean, there's more condos going on than anybody knows what to do with. When we consider that glut, we're seeing a real struggle for, you know, rents, number one. And, and then secondly, you've got a trend that we're starting to see, which is people are looking for more space. And, you know, so one bedroom apartments are not appealing to many because there's, yeah. you know, even if you're not working from home, if we're locked down for extended periods of time or restricted or you're temporarily unemployed while you wait for things to fire up again, which is what's going on in Edmonton right now, for example, and in other, and well, right across the country, then you want that space. And being in a one bedroom, even a two bedroom apartment is, is a tough, is a tough gig right? It's a tough place to be. So those trends, we don't, you know, how long are they going to go? It's going to really depend on what we as a society are going to, you know, what, what is the pandemic going to lead us to? So that's mm-hmm. kind of where I'm at. I, I, I think real estate investors who stayed focused on buying for cash flow, who want to manage their properties well, who saw the future and, and weren't trying to, you know, make harvest gold continue to work. You know, it's like who upgraded and really, looked at their client base and said, who are, who is my demographic? Who am I, you know, who is my client base and stayed focused on that client base are, are doing okay. You know, they're actually doing quite well for those who were pay, probably not paying attention to it, not upgrading their properties, not reinvesting in their properties. Then yeah, there was probably some real challenges along the way. And, um, and so here we are, right? Yeah. That's my view. I, I think there's I, I think there's a model for everything, I suppose, but you know, mine is definitely to offer a quality product and treat tenants with dignity. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've been very fortunate that uh, you know everybody's been able to pay rent. Yeah, and uh, you know, just listening to their listening to their issues and problems and sticking it out with them. Um, there, there are some people are going through some rough times, but absolutely. Uh, so far they're they're coming out and but it, you know treating people right is is very important and that has to do with the product that you're offering them as well well it is and, and you you do you know something everybody's kind of got their own challenges you know maybe it's your tenant with with that's lost a job and is barely making ends meet 
uh, you as a landlord are, are trying to cover, you know, cash shortages and, you know, the fact that you're paying mortgages and taxes and all the rest of it and, and you're being challenged. So it is this big, you know, it, it really is challenging times. Some are seeing it through better. Uh, it goes back to, do you have the cash, the wherewithal, the career, the job, the business that can offset some of the costs against, you know, the, the, the loss on the real estate side of the, of the equation, right? And it always yeah. boils down to, you know, liquidity and, and how liquid can you be? So I think you're right. I, you know, I, I think overall the feedback I get from the rain community is, yeah, there are, are those that are challenged and uh, no question about it, but many others are not. Many are actually uh, okay with this market. They're, they're seeing the opportunities and they're creating opportunities. And I think that's, that's the shift. It's like, you know, <laughs> which is a kind of a, a, a view of the world when you were a young man and uh, and how you went along the way, you were creating opportunities along the way. That's what you did. That was what, that's really the entrepreneurial spirit right there is the ability to create opportunities and it's not seeing opportunities. It's actually seeing the place to create an opportunity, which is what you were very good at. I want to, and, and I want to get off this topic a little bit because I don't want to step over a question I have for you because you know, you had a great deal of success. Uh, you had done a lot of stuff in the dentistry world. You had accomplished a lot. You'd made a lot of money. And then you went all in on a, on a, on a deal that didn't work. Or two or three of them. Or two or three of them. Right, right. Well, once again, you know, too many, right? But, but here's the question I have for you. Aside from, you know, the hindsight and, oh, I shouldn't have done that. And I forgot to check in on that. And, you know, you recognize one of your patterns or one uh, a pattern being you're confident you've done it before you you know you were confident that you could figure whatever out you know figure it out i'll learn it i'll figure it out so you're confident in that didn't work out quite that way so you now find yourself living with friends in Guelph but the question i guess i have for you is what's the mental process what's the emotional mental strain that you were observing of yourself like I get, you know, bummed out, depression, probably some anger, pissed off at yourself, all the things that you know, we, we can emotionally go through. But where were the people in your life? Were you still surrounded with good friends? Did you still have a core group of people that were yeah. patting you on yeah. the back, you know, saying, listen, you got this and, you know, supporting you along the way? Can you give me a little bit of that? Because I know, here's the reason I asked the question. In all the years of coaching and conversations and my own experience is that, you know, the fear of that, you know, of the inevitable, it's all going to go off the rails. You know, the fear of that. You, you've, you, you may have not gone 100% off the rails, but you took a really big blow. And what was your experience of that? Was it, was it as bad as you thought? Was it worse than you thought? Was it even a thought that you're thinking how you know, like what was the what was the mindset and the and the emotional mental kind of game that you had to play to get through that time, Jeff? Okay, I, I want to start by saying too much cash. If we have too much of our own cash, mm -hmm. uh, we and cash and confidence, I guess. So those investments were made with my own cash, mm -hmm. and in fact, we bought the business with cash. We didn't finance it. When we shut it down, we paid all of the staff, all the suppliers. The only people who lost were the owners. Mm. Uh, and so everybody exited fine. And you're familiar with the phantom limb. If uh, somebody's had a limb amputated, yeah. you, you feel like it's still there. Well, when you lose a bunch of cash, it takes, I, I don't recall now, but at least six months, you think it's still there or it should be still there or it's coming back or I can use this, but it's not there. <laughs> and so, so at some point you need to cross over into, okay, what am I going to do? And, and you do need people around to support you. I had training in, in real estate back in the eighties, which is when I acquired some properties. I held some of them for some time and I bought a few more when I was in Ottawa, but I had always figured you could buy properties, make them cash flow with little or no money down, and you could figure out a way to do that. And I was having a really difficult time figuring out how to do that in 2009, 10. Got some training from you, Patrick, and uh, realized that I can partner with people. And all of a sudden, I realized 
that in my network, most most of my closest people in my network had fifty or hundred thousand dollars saved up, and had a minimum income of fifty or seventy thousand dollars was enough to qualify for one of these smaller properties. And so I figured I'll start with what I have and and go there. And I've always had great credit. I've not, never missed a payment on anything in my life. But when you don't have a job, you can't qualify. Mm-hmm. So I, I had no cash for down payments and I couldn't qualify. I also learned that if you like it, really basic, simple stuff, put enough cash down so that you your property will carry. So you've got good positive cash flow and take good care of that property. Over time, you'll pay down the mortgage, you'll benefit from cash flow, and you'll have appreciation. On top of that, when you get a little bit better, you want to buy stuff that's below market value and do something to add value. So there's those five ways of making money in real estate. And I knew I needed to start somewhere. So you're right. I had a good network of friends when they learned what happened with the other businesses. And they learned that people did not lose by being part of what I was doing. They said, what are you doing next? Can I do it with you? So I I would I made a tour of my friends in uh, in Vancouver where I, I know several people. I just had breakfast, lunch, or coffee with them just because I needed to re-enter. I needed to I need to be around people that loved me and and re-energize myself. And I was starting to you know starting to formulate. I've got ten thousand hours in real estate. That's something I can definitely do. I now know how I can do it. Um, and I just I just made a tour of visiting with people. And here's what we did. We went for coffee or breakfast or lunch. And I just asked them about them. We just talked about them and, and they encouraged me and it was, it was good to be with them. And if, and only if they asked me what I was doing next, did I tell them, but it was really just a process of coming back into the world after being knocked out at the knees for a few months. So it sounds like you turned it around pretty quick. Mm, Well, I, just before you said that, I was, I was going to say there's this expression uh, starting over again. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I had it. I was fine. I've lost it. Now I'm starting over. We're not starting over. I, I was, you know, I was considerably older and wiser. I had a world of relationships that I didn't have when I was younger. And I had experience I didn't have when I was younger. So when I realized what I had, I was able to... Uh, I, I was able to get going. And I, and that's actually the topic of the, of the book that I'm working on called Your Unfair Advantage. So your unfair advantage really is the relationships that you have, the resources that you have, and the resourcefulness. So I had re- great relationships. I had some things, resources. I didn't have assets or cash, but I had education experience. And I knew that I could find the things that I didn't have. And everybody's got that. If we, if we sit down and think about who are the people that we know, what do we know, and how curious are we, or how, 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 how resilient are we to go out and find those things that are missing, where those three circles intersect is our unfair advantage. Mm. And it took me a while to discover and to just kind of relax into that really is to like i have people that trust me and love me and care about me and know about my background and i have experiences all, all the all those mistakes i've made and the courses i took and the books i read and the real estate investments that they all accumulate and they become resources things that i have to offer and things that i can do and i also knew from my earlier business experiences and I'm sure Patrick, you'll resonate with this too. If you're doing anything, the, the beauty of a capitalist system is if you're missing something, somebody's going to come along and offer to sell you that. Mm-hmm. So we don't need to have everything figured out before we start. If we've got a few of those things together, we can start. And the things that are missing, I remember when I rented my first property after many years, I didn't have a, even have a rental agreement. <laughs> sure. <laughs> 
and 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 you 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 do it the next the first time and you go okay I'm going to need more of these, so you pick up you know you pick up a bunch of them, and and you start developing systems going forward. But I think it's when we when we connect our relationships, our resources, and our resourcefulness, and find out that sweet spot in the middle that gives us an unfair advantage that um, we're able to come alive again and and uh, start doing what we were created to do, what we're here on the earth to do. Well, it's an interesting, you know, I love the, I love the, you know, the, you know, what you said there, which is, you know, we don't, we're not really starting over. We have, we've built up, like if in this case, and, and I could, let me see if I can get clear on this thought, because when you look at what we've done in our life is, is I'm, I'm working with, I'll give you here, let me go, I'm jumping around a bit because I'm trying to get clear on the thought, but I'm working with a, a number of clients right now. And I, what I had them do is I had them write and they're all mature and I had them write their bios and I look at the bios and I go, wow, that's really impressive. You know, there's, if you look at those bios, I see this list of all of the things that they've done, the doingness of things. And, and they're in the process of wanting to reinvent themselves for various reasons or add on and do all the things that they're trying to do. But it's interesting how we read our bios of all the things that we've done. And I, and I step back from it and I go, okay, but this isn't about what you've done. Okay, got it. You've accomplished this. That's cool. This is about who you had to be and what you had to become to achieve that outcome. So let's just take, take that particular task off the list and say, okay, think about all of the skills that you, you know, that evolved and developed the, uh, you know, the, the competencies that you had to gain which really speaks to what you're saying here is you're not starting over. So take off, well, I was a this, I was a dentist, or I ran a, a great dentistry practice, or, or I was a great, you know, uh, president of a company. It really, that's an accomplishment, that's an outcome, but you then take all of what you had to become, what you had to develop, who you had to be to be successful at that, and take that into any next thing for you. You're not starting over again, and and it's 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 such an interesting. I think people in general don't see that, so I think it's very it's it's kind of a an interesting point that you got to with that because uh, at a time where I'm seeing it as well differently, but the same is like no, we're not starting over again. You know, uh, you're actually got a lot of stuff underneath you that uh, may not look like dentistry, it may not even look like real estate, it may not look like the retail industry, but where do those skills? that you've developed and the competencies and the person you are that you've developed, where does, where do you get to apply that? Am I on the track of what you're talking about? Yeah. Or did I, I go off on a whole tangent? It was a good one. I, th <laughs> I think when, uh, when you look at bios that you ask people you're coaching or mentoring um, to write and ask them what they think, many times they think it's no big deal. Mm -hmm. Oh, for and sure. Yet you're looking at her. I'm looking at going, do you see what you have here? <laughs> yeah. um, because, you know, we know what we know and it's no big deal. But uh, making those connections is so important because there are people that want to support you. There are things that you've acquired over time. If you're young, you've got the energy to figure them out. If you're older, you've got the experiences. It's just it's, it's just taking a step back and, and appreciating what you've been, what you've received or what you've been given over your lifetime. That um, that you can put it together and, and, and do what is next for you. So you've built this portfolio, you know, you went in back into the real estate game, you've uh, created great partnerships uh, and you're, it sounds like you're primarily the operating guy. There's money, you got, you got the kind of a traditional, you've got money partners and you're primarily the, the operating guy and you may have a team of people, but is, is that, is that the scenario you're in right now? Is that what I'm hearing? Yes. Uh, my, my default now is to partner on everything. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, I, I may not always do that, but my default is whether it's buying a business or buying uh, real estate is how can I, or, or, or starting a business, how can I find somebody that, um, that will benefit, uh, that, that we can help each other and, and benefit different arrangements on different deals, but generally the operating guy, mm -hmm. um, I I appreciate what you're saying. I don't use the word money partner. I just say partner mm -hmm. uh, because uh, you know, in when you're when you're doing larger deals, 
uh, and and people are investing a million dollars or more, mm-hmm. there's a good chance that uh, they have something you can learn from them. Oh, they got a lot of savvy. They didn't. Yeah, they didn't get that so, liquid with, without knowing some stuff. Yeah. So whether you're the operating partner or not, it's it's wise to uh, engage in in their uh, their savvy. Let me ask you this question then, and, and I love the conversation around partners. You know, we we actually teach raising capital kind of, uh, we, we actually have a raising capital program. And one of the things that my team and I are, are big on, which is relationship, which is uh, attracting partners is one thing, but attracting the right partner is another thing. And, and there's going to be times where you're going to have to step away from the table and on the table, it's going to be some big checks. But when you look at the relationship, and the expectations of a particular partner or what that might look like, it may not be the right partnership. That's how I view it. You know, when you're getting into a long-term financial arrangements with anybody, it is a, it's a partnership. You got to, you got to share common values. You got to make sure that you're sharing, uh, uh, you're aligned on your goals, aligned on maybe some business philosophy, but what's your experience given what you're doing right now, Jeff? Well, first, I want to say I learned a lot about raising capital from you, Patrick, or from Rain. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, whatever we do, though, we have to take it, make it our own. Mm-hmm. Take take everything that we learn and go. Okay, this works for me. That won't. I'll do this. I won't do this. This part works. I, I, I'm I'm a big believer in in uh, in making it your own. Mm-hmm. And I also agree with your relationships. Had I burned relationships, I would have had a much, much, much more difficult time mm-hmm. of uh, coming back. So relationships are critically important. One of the things that I, I've i already alluded to is uh, relationship is first, if and only if some, unless I'm raising, specifically raising capital for something, we can talk about that a little bit. But if I'm meeting with people that are potential partners, I'm actually not even going to introduce the topic unless they ask me. I'm, I'm going to focus on them uh, at some point, and it might be uh, it might be minutes or years. Uh, they might say, oh, wh- why do we always talk about me? Let's talk about you. <laughs> what are you doing, Jeff? <laughs> and if I tell them what I'm doing and they express interest, then uh, I already know like it's a it's a deep, long lasting trusting relationship and that uh you know then then i'll move to talk about uh possibility of partnering on a smaller deal Mm -hmm. on that and the bigger ones there's always a question that i ask and you know i I put it back Uh, once i've explained everything i try to talk them out of it of of doing um, business with me because uh, you know, I'll say, you know, this is what we're going to do. And then this, and then this, and then this, and this happens. And this is your role. This is my role. Sounds pretty complicated and pretty risky, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. And if they don't respond to me and say, no, not really, because you're going to do this and this, and I do this and this, and then, and then this is what we get at the end. When they can repeat that back to me, I know that's probably going to be a good partner. But if they're just kind of, yeah, I trust you. Um, <laughs> Uh, go for it. I get a little concerned about that. What have you seen, you know, if you were to, you know, if you, because you've been in the world of education, coaching, real estate, is there one, two, three common, I don't want to call them mistakes, but we'll call them mistakes for lack of a better word right now. Is there, is there some common mistakes that you see that you would highlight that you would want to share with the audience listening today? Yeah, I have, uh, uh, my 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 poor most poorly listen my my most poorly viewed video on YouTube is first is worst, mm. <laughs> and I spell worst wrong. But your first deal in anything is going to be the worst one, mm-hmm. um, if at all possible. Do it yourself. Don't bring a partner in on that. You're going to make all your mistakes on the first one, but you need to learn from them. And like I said, I didn't have a rental agreement. As soon as I realized I need a rental agreement get a bunch where are you going to get them from and start creating systems so don't be surprised on every deal figure figure it out right so first is not not getting started is is one mm-hmm. um having the confidence to get started another is uh, i have let, let's say i've got some uh, you know under the resources I've, I've got cash so i don't need help i'm gonna i'm gonna buy property and qualify myself i don't need any help that's a mistake or what if um, 
what if I'm really handy with a hammer? I think it's the wooden part that you hold. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not sure myself <laughs> because fortunately I'm not. Yeah, yeah. Um, but if, if you can renovate properties, you want to go in and do that yourself. Mm-hmm. I'm really good at selecting tenants. Mm. I have a hard time allowing somebody else to do that. And I feel I create a lot of value doing that, but it does take up my time. The more that we can, I say, first, first time you muddle through, then you create a system, and then next you start teaching somebody else. Mm-hmm. So the more that we can do that from the beginning to say, okay, my first was the worst. I did one. I used my own cash and my own credit. I have a little bit more cash to do another one. I'm not going to do it that way again. Now I know how to do it. I'm going to start creating systems to do it. And I'm going to use, I'm going to partner with people. And that's how you leverage and grow. When you think you're going to do it yourself, or you think that I'm the only one that's going to be able to renovate this the way it needs to be done, that's going to hold you back. Mm-hmm. And so I know I'm not telling you anything that you don't already know, but people need to hear that, that we, we, we need to work into our strengths. But if you're going to scale and grow, you need to, first of all, muddle through, second, create a system, and then third, find and teach somebody else. Mm-hmm. Those are the areas where, where I've grown in, and, uh, and to the extent that I try to hang on to them myself, I'm not able to grow. You know, and if, and if I've learned nothing over, you know, 20 plus years of being part of the, you know, rain community is that I know nothing and I, and I can't even, you know, I, I joke about it all the time is, and I don't have to know anything because I know somebody who knows something, right? Like, it's, yeah. I, I can always connect a dot. I have, you know, I, I got a question. If I got a challenge, you know, I got a whole community of people who have, there's going to be somebody or a, a number of people that have experienced, done it put out that fire, you know, had that success, taken on that deal. So it's, it is really, you know, interesting to know how little I know and be okay with that and not have any ego around it because with what's going on in the real estate world, because we're a national community, there is just no doubt that there's some really, really brilliant people that have done some cool stuff. So I ask you because, you know, you're playing in a different game now, you know, you've been through some uh, challenging times, you've seen them through, you're in the middle of continuing to grow and move forward. And with that comes learning that I, I wouldn't necessarily have that experience around. So it's always, I always ask the question around perspective, because, you know, it's pretty easy to have blinders on or to get tunnel vision. And so it's, you know, hearing what you're talking about, and the lessons that you've learned along the way, you know, a question I want to ask you about is, is around when you go back to that time, and I think Don Campbell used to call it professor syndrome. Like, I got this. I got this figured out, right? I know what the hell's going on. And, you know, it sounds like there may have been some version of that going on for you in that time. But do you think that today you sit here better, more humble, more cautious? What what would what what did you learn? It, what when you look back at that and what you've learned from that today that you're applying, what are some of those lessons along the way, Jeff? Definitely more humble. Um, I think you were referring to. Uh, I, I didn't think you knew me that well. I think when you're. <laughs> <laughs> so I went through a phase of I've got this. I'm arrogant. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I went through you know kind of frustration, like okay, like I know this, like you know I, I've, I've got it. But, uh, you know, there, there's this phrase that we hear often, especially this past year, we're, we're living in uncertain times. We have always lived in uncertain times. Nobody knows the future. Mm-hmm. Interest rates could go up or they could go down. Property values could go up or they could go down. I've made mistakes. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I, I regret the mistakes that I've made. And so uh, we can also get burned and get overcautious and and be afraid to move to the next step so i think um getting good people around me is important i my renovator's name is jim he's been with me since the beginning there is rarely a call that i'm on the phone with him that at the end i don't say thank you Mm. i i could not have done anything without him same with my realtor you know there's there's people that you know, I, Patrick, you were saying that, you know, you've got lots to learn. You're, you know, sometimes you think you're not very smart, but you've got, I don't know if you said that, but you know, I, I feel the same way. There's 
people around me that put that together. So it's just just the relationships, the people that are going to come around you, especially in a community like Rain. You're going to find the people, and and they might not be the ones you start with, but you'll find the people that resonate with you. And um, I, I, you know, I, I was talking to uh, my coach uh, a week ago, and something about I said, I've just been lucky. You know, everything I've told you, Patrick, today, I, I was in the right place, at the right time, and I had. You know, somebody called me and I was able to do something and I, I was I was lucky. I've just been lucky. And and he said that he has a client that he works with who works with CEOs. And he says, do you know that most CEOs of major companies figure that they were lucky and they wouldn't be able to replicate their success? <laughs> I, I, you know, something I, I, I have a tendency to agree with that. You know, I see that in myself sometimes. You know, How did you fall into being who you are, Patrick? Well, I know, I know, right? <laughs> in, in my entrepreneurial journey, my entrepreneurial accidents, it's crazy. You know, when I joined Rain back in 2000, you know, I, it wasn't to one day be the owner and CEO. It wasn't, you know, like, how does that all happen? I yeah. don't know, right? It's one of those things that <laughs> just shows up. I was just lucky. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it is, it is interesting to reflect. And when you talk about surrounding yourself with people, I, the one lesson that I would share with anybody. And that is try and avoid at all costs being the smartest person in the room for an extended period of time. And that's really, I, I wish I would have gotten that lesson much sooner, mm -hmm. which is be okay and really work to surround yourself with people that are way freaking smarter than you are. And uh, that opens up a whole different door of opportunity and growth and possibility and that was, I think, what I'm hearing you say in all of this is understanding that it doesn't matter how smart you are. Make sure you're surrounding yourself with much smarter people. And, and that would be guidance now that I, I give anybody uh, who is being an entrepreneur in business, you know, be the dumbest person in the room and be happy you are because you're in the right room. Yeah. You know, I think I'd add to that. Um, don't be overly impressed by other people mm -hmm. don't be impressed by patrick don't be impressed by me mm -hmm. nobody knows what you think they know they are leveraging other relationships uh, in order to accomplish what they are set your goals that are important to you not to competing with somebody else you know you can be an everyday millionaire with one or two properties that's exactly right you, you don't need to have a large portfolio. Nope. I bristle against people who, who ask me if I'm a full-time real estate investor. My goodness, no. The reason I'm a real estate investor is so I don't have to work full-time. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to play around in real estate. I want to have a bunch of assets, which I do, that mm -hmm. work for me. Mm -hmm. So I've known you know, medical doctors, chiropractors who are, you know, they've, they've got a high level of income and they're trying to learn a new career which is how to invest in real estate. It, it, it's not necessary. Do, do what you're good at, then you know, engage the relationships you have. And, uh, and if, if all you need is a second or third home so that it will be paid off by the time you're ready to downsize or retire, you'll have a great life. That's what you should do. You know, it's, it's such great ad advice. You know, that's just great guidance. You know, I remember... I, I can't even count how many times somebody's walked up, generally younger, you know, and I and I always remember one story of a, a Rain member, a young lady who came up to me. She had just joined and become a Rain member. And she goes, Patrick, what should I do? And I says, well, tell me a little bit. Like, I haven't even bought my first property yet. I want to buy my first property. And I go, great. What do you do? And she goes, well, I'm a nurse. And I says, do you love being a nurse? She goes, I love being a nurse. I love being a nurse. And I go, great. Can you see yourself buying one property this year? And she goes, oh, yeah, for sure. I could do one for sure. I go, great. Go buy one property. And do you think you could buy one property a year for the next three, four, five years? She goes, yeah, I could do that. I go, great. Go be an amazing nurse and buy one property a year for the next three, four, five years. And you'll do just fine. Yeah. And you know something? Three years later, she came up to me and, and still a RAIN member very quiet, didn't see her. She wasn't standout-ish as, you know, in, in the community in any any way, shape, or form. But she came up to me and and uh, she said to me, she goes, you know something, I bought five properties in three years and uh, I got my science degree in uh, to add to my nursing or whatever that was at the time. 
And she goes, it was, she says, I really just appreciate that guidance because I was, I remember how overwhelmed I was and how that just got me going, okay, I can do that. And she went and did it. And it was a, and it was a great story, right? Because people overcomplicate stuff to your point, go be a great dentist, go be a, an amazing pilot, nurse, electrician, whatever it is, and be that. And, and then just buy one or two pieces of property and it'll be, and nurses, life will be great. Nurses are awesome. They are. Nurses are, <laughs> nurses are awesome. And they are. Real estate is a tool. It is. That's it. You know, it's an, like we need to understand what investment is. Yeah. To, to me, investment is limiting current consumption in favor of future consumption. If you love being a nurse, Go, be a nurse. Be a nurse. And, and take some of your cash and put it into real estate and in the future you'll have the benefit it's so interesting i love being a business owner i love business real estate's just a side hustle real estate's just something that i want to build other assets you know yeah. I, I you know and that's it i love being a business owner you know and the challenges of it drive me crazy and at the same time i don't know what i would do that i didn't love more and 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 in the world of rain it's a perfect world for me because i get to own a business i get to be a contribution in supporting others success and so for me, it like hits all the hot spots for me, helping people achieve success, being a business owner. And I, and I go, yeah, and, and I can take capital and invest in real estate, which is brilliant. Like to me, I, I go, this is my perfect yeah. world. That's why I'm on the Freedom 95 program. Yeah, you know, <laughs> me too. So, so the, uh, I don't love real estate. I, I love figuring things out. I yeah. love solving problems. See, that's the fundamental right there. Just stop yeah. right there. I get it. And that's the thing that people have got to identify. They go, I love real estate. And my question always is, well, what do you love about real estate? It's just bricks and mortar. Well, what do yeah. you love about it? Well, when they break it down, they start to realize that there are certain aspects of it that they really love, whether it be finding the deal, finding the right tenants, the challenge of getting financing, bringing partners together. That's what they're really into. Because, because real estate, once the deal's done, it's just boring old real estate if you've done it right. There's nothing exciting about it just does its thing. Yeah. Right. And, and, and another, you know, you, we throw this word passion around. What are you passionate about? I'm passionate about real estate. I'm not. No. The, the word passion literally means suffering. What, what are you willing to suffer for? I'm not willing to suffer for a building. I am willing to suffer for my partners, mm -hmm. for those relationships. Mm -hmm. I will do anything for them. Yeah. Yeah. It's real estate is a great investment tool. But um, we need to be careful about getting caught up. And when I, when I see somebody leaving something they love, thinking this is going to make them more money uh, and not realizing that if, you know, if you have what it takes to make $100,000 a year because you've gone to school for whatever length of time in that field, understand it's probably going to take as much work to get to that point in yeah. real estate, whatever that means. <laughs> yeah, yeah, 100%. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I, my, I, I want to talk a little bit about my lifestyle because I feel like that was something that you usually talk about. Sure. Yes. Um, it's very simple. Freedom is my biggest uh, value, uh, having, having freedom. Uh, I drive the 2003 Saab. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't make them anymore. It looks like new. I take good care of it. Um, I, I don't see any need to be to be splurging and spending some kind of millionaire's lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Living within our means and, and having the ability to um, support ourselves, give to others, and have a little bit of security in the future is, I think, probably what many of the people that you interview pursue a lifestyle like that. It's, it's good to get the, right, get the right things in order. It's not about what we have. Mm -hmm. um, it's about who we're becoming through the process and how we're able to help other people. So I, back to partners again, I love the relationship with the partners. It gives, I, I'm not married. I have no kids, but I have my relationship with my partners. I treat them like family mm -hmm. and to have somebody to do projects with, uh, it goes much, much deeper than just an investment or it's what gives me joy is, is helping, helping others to create um, wealth as well. There's an interesting word that you just use, joy. There's a word that I don't use, which is passion. I consciously don't use the word hate. I, don't, I think it's, it's 
I'll f bomb all over the place before I use the word hate. I don't think it's a it's not a healthy word. Yeah. Um, and I don't you actually very often use the word success in a context about being successful. I I, I think it's a it's an overused word, and I think it's bullshit. There's no definition for it. And uh, you know, some of the least successful quote you know air quotes people I know are the most successful people I know. You know, yeah. and and it's an interesting. So I don't use that word, and I actually don't even use the word happy too much because it's once again, I you know the word that really shows up for me often is joy. And and how do I feel about my life? And how do I feel about what I'm doing? And and really that that's what drives it. So that's kind of a, a an aside. But when you're talking about the relationships that you've created in the world of real estate. And how you show up in those relationships, and and really that's what real estate is for you. It's about the relationships, and and even in my business, in businesses, it's about the relationships that I have with my team and with my clients and all the rest of it. That's what that's what really floats my boat. That's what that's what brings me joy. And if I don't have that, man, oh man, it gets really dark really fast. Yeah, I I like everything you said about words. Words are very important. The words They're that we huge. use how we yep. think about them. Yep. Uh, I'm going to steer this conversation in a slightly different direction on the word joy. Uh, there is a fantastic author out of Calgary now, I think named Mark Buchanan, who wrote a book called Your God is Too Safe. And in one of his chapters, he uh, describes joy. And the story is about a... Maybe his neighbor had a dog that he hated, would lurch at the fence and uh, and yap at him all the time. Anyway, the neighbor and his kids were going camping one weekend. They asked Pastor Mark to uh, uh, look after the dog, Max, and all he had to do was feed Max. So feed Max, let him out in the backyard, let him in, feed Max, let him out in the backyard, let him in. He went over one day and Max was gone. Mm. Realized that he may have left the gate open, dog got out, and he thought that he was going to have to call his neighbor and tell him that, that Max is gone. And uh, he, was, he was getting ready to make the phone call, went over one last time. He opened the door, looked up at the top of the stairs, and there was Max, and he said, that was joy. So joy is that exhilaration that comes when we realize that we've avoided disaster. <laughs> and... And on a spiritual sense, you know, you, you hear sometimes a term, the joy of my salvation. We're not getting out of this life, you know, with, without having to meet our maker at some point. And making that decision in our lifetime is important. So it's how we treat people and understanding where we are in this universe. So focusing on, uh, on our, the, the spiritual side of our life is uh, well, I, I was going to say at least as important as the material as some of the things that we've been talking about today, but there's there's all eternity to consider in in, uh, in our conversations with people. There is. Jeff, this has been such a great conversation. Um, and as we start to wind down, there are um, some fun I'd like to have, which just is in some rapid fire questions, what we call rapid fire. And, and, and often they're not rapid fire, but let's do our best to to okay. do some, have some fun and rapid fire questions. You have not seen these questions in advance. It's, uh, you know, this is just you reacting to them as you see them. So that's the fun part about it. Okay. Then they're not hard questions. What's your favorite book? Do you have one, a favorite book that you have read or that you gift, uh, something that you, uh, you I don't, recommend? I don't too often read the same book twice, mm -hmm. but I'm reading Insurgents by Frank Viola. Hmm. Um, and uh, I, of course, would say that the Bible is, is first. I read that every year. Insurgents, what is the book? It's about understanding the kingdom of God. Oh, interesting. iPhone or Android? iPhone. Okay. Favorite swear word? Don't have one. Is that because you don't swear or because you just don't have a favorite? Oh, <laughs> I, uh, my mother taught me well. Okay, great. Uh, I, I I do try to I, I do try to keep it clean. Yeah, yeah. On a scale of one to ten, how weird is Jeff Gunther? Eleven. Yep. Okay. Room desk or car? What do you clean first? Definitely the car. Definitely the car. You like it? You like your shiny two thousand and three Saab? <laughs> That's almost a collector thing now, right? Or it's just an old almost. car. <laughs> Favorite tune? Do you have one? 
I'm not a big music guy. You're not. I, I, I would I would say um, I'm a big uh, Rolling Stones fan. Do you have a favorite movie? No. Nope. Today, Jeff, what are you grateful for? I'm grateful for my parents. Hmm. They're in their mid 80s. They're um, kind of lonely together. Mm -hmm. um, I love that they love each other. They're very different from each other. Mm -hmm. they're, they're each other's best friends. And I've been talking to them at least once a week since March. I should have learned that earlier in my life. So having great parents. That's great. I'm grateful for my 92-year-old mother who's still here today and uh, love to have that. And I'm grateful for you to be on the show today, Jeff. So I appreciate you joining me today. And uh, thanks very much. And I look forward to uh, talking again. Thank you, Patrick. It's been a pleasure being here. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening. If you found value in the podcast, please take the time to rate and review and share with others. Share with your friends as it is my goal to always improve and to provide the highest value for you, the listener. If you have any comments, suggestions, or questions you'd like answered, please email me at ceo at raincanada.com. That's ceo at reincanada.com. I look forward to hearing from you. And until next time, Patrick out.